The Anime Studio Pro 10 timeline is a fairly rich and complex little tool set, although it looks very simple, and that's good. Who wants to deal with complex looking tools? Let me show you what I mean by that. Inside this timeline area, we just have a recording of our animation over time. We see these dots, and I've got a scene loaded in. Unless you've changed the preferences, it will auto-load one of their new characters into it that kind of highlights some of the new cool features that you have working with this program. And to emphasize that, they've animated it so you can see a lot of these things in action. It's a fantastic tool set, and we'll explore all these things in significantly more detail later on. But from a top-down view, let's take a look at how these things are integrated and how to treat them or things to be aware of as we start working on our characters themselves. We've got a frame counter here, and all the drawing you do, or any types of file imports you do, are notated right here and should be done at frame zero. Frame zero is before time begins in any animation. It's where you do all your construction so that as soon as you advance to the first frame, you're ready to begin animating and the program starts to remember where everything is. And then as you continue down the timeline, it goes ahead and notates what's going on. And that's what these little dots are. They're called keyframes, key points in time. And the history behind that is way back in the days of Disney when they got started is that Walt Disney would draw some key frames of cell animation, and then the lackeys that did all the work would draw in between and join those keyframes together into an animation. Well, the program does it for you automatically. So every significant event that has taken place inside of this animation so far is notated by a keyframe that is created automatically when you do that. If I click on this little red item right here where the timeline indicator is, and we drag it down the scene, we see our character moving. And if we go back and look carefully when we get near a certain keyframe, something happens, like right here is an eye blink that's going on. Well, that's one of those items. But the keyframe and the timeline itself is linked over here into this layer palette we have as well. We're seeing just a very top-down collection of specific keyframes. But for every one of these individual items, they themselves, for example, this shape could change. And that change would be notated if I grabbed one of these corners at this point in time. The program would go, oh, look, the shape is changing, and make a keyframe for it. And we would see that by selecting that specific layer inside of this pirate character itself. At the top level, with the bones selected, all we're seeing right now are the keyframes that go for the bones. But if there's some for the hands, they'll show up separately. Shapes show up separately. If we've got eyes going on with switch layers, those things show up as well. So there's ways that separate keyframes are actually hidden inside of the layers here that you just need to be aware of as we start working with characters themselves. We can see that we've got something called a sequencer. This is a way to change components of animation without having to go back in and drag keyframes or reanimate. Very, very cool tool, saves a ton of time, so we'll deal a lot with that in the future. We also have a motion graph, which allows us to select specific items at a specific point in time and see how it looks and change the curves, how smooth the animation is from keyframe to keyframe. We've got other little items that we'll get into in greater detail. This section right here is for tweeners. We've got some ability to go ahead and do some typical animation tricks to look at work ahead of and behind where we are at a current point in time. Clicking something like this will let me see what's going on with the characters as we move through the time, but we'll look at that again in greater detail. Something I do want to call your attention to is that you can control how much of your timeline is going to be rendered out into an animation with this control set right here. Right now, our red timeline indicator is on frame 44, and I can either count up to ticks from 42, or I can simply look here at frame 44 and go, oh, there we are. There is a total of 78 frames in this animation, and that's visually cued by the fact that this area from 78 to the left is all lavender, and on the other side of this, it's gray. If we wanted an animation that was 102 frames long, I could simply come in here, type 102, and we would see this lavender area extend to the frame 102. Now these lines here in the middle, these are seconds. Our current settings for this animation, without even opening the settings box, lets me know that there are 24 frames per second. So by extending our animation to 102 frames, looking down here, we can see that the animation is just a little over four seconds long. 
We also can divide our workspace up to help us animate a little bit more clearly. We've got side-by-side -side windows. We've got a default single window that's open, but if we click this, we can go ahead and move differently inside of each one of these frames. We can change it from a vertical to a horizontal format, or we can actually go into a quad format. And the larger your screen is, the more beneficial this will be as you start working with more and more complex scenes. We also have the ability right here to change our display quality. And I'm going to come back here and select a single frame representation again. When I click on this, and I can't help it, I'm sorry, some of this goes off the screen right here in the little space I'm working with. But these are all the details that you can deal with when you have an on-screen presentation. There's some shortcut buttons, low, medium, and high. By default, we're on high. And there's one item here that is fade unselected layers we'll come back and look at in more detail. Usually, keep it on high. It will give you the best preview of what's going on in your scene. But if you're working with a laptop that's maxing out its resources or on an older system, you may want to choose one of these medium or low options as well.